Okay, I have 1031. This is uh, Chair Lampy. I'll take over, Chris. Thank you for yep. setting this up. Uh, it's officially 1031. I'm going to call the meeting in order at this time. Uh, Polly, you could do a uh, roll call for me, please. Okay. Trace Kendig. Patrick Upstate. Present. Peter Huffman. Here. Jenny Hyde. Here. Tom Lampy. Blake Gerushi. Here. Annette Dunn. Wendy Hess. Andy Buffington. Michelle Bischoff. Present. David Ness. Here. Rob Roger. Here. Jason Schlutenhofer. Here. Angela Clouser. And we do have a forum. Yep. Hey, uh, Holly. This is Chris. Really quickly, I see that Wendy Hass is in the process of signing into the Go To meeting, also, so she will likely be here shortly. Okay. And uh, did you want and to check? Oh, go ahead. Did you want to check to see if the stand-in for the DNR is here today? Yes, I believe he's on. I see him on the Go To meeting. Matt Bruner, are you on? Maybe not. Holly, I had issues with the go to meeting. Is the go to meeting uh, visual only, no audio? Yes. We have it connected to the conference line. Yeah. Oh, it, right. But you have to call in separately? Yes. When I was on the go to meeting, it was silent. And usually it's one or the other, not both. So that, that might be some people's confusion. If there's a way to put that on. To go to meeting. Chris and I were just talking about that this morning. It, it, it's not crystal clear. So. Okay. Are you guys talking about the audio? Yeah. Is there not a way to connect to audio in the go-to meeting? Sorry, I probably just missed that conversation. <laughs> That's right. You're all, you're all good. Do you want to... Yeah, we'll work on that for next month. Uh, for now, uh, I'm... I know I thought we had the phone number listed in the GoTo meeting invite, but uh, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'll have to look to see how to integrate that more effectively next time. So, but uh, apologize for the confusion. Yeah, it just uh, it, typically it's one or the other, right? So, so it's just I think people who are, are are not accustomed to how this meeting works or haven't been on the, wasn't on the last virtual meeting might be a little. A little perplexed by why the go to meeting line is silent. Okay. We can start with the uh, introduction of board members, please. Starting with Blake, I'll just go down the list on the side of the agenda. Blake Tarushi, Iowa Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Andy. Andy Buffington, Winnebago and Hancock Emergency Management Communications. Angela Clouser. Rob Rotter. Rob Rotter, Iowa County Sheriff's Office. Jason Slutenhofer. Jason Slutenhofer, Wright County Sheriff. Michelle Bischoff. Uh, Michelle Bischoff, Moines Fire, representing uh, Iowa Country. And I'm Tom Lanty, I'm from DPS. David Ness. Dwayne Boyce, Toronto. Wendy Heiss, or Hess, sorry. Wendy Hess from Woodbury County Communications. Cindy Hike. Peter Huffman. Peter Huffman, uh, Department of Transportation. And I have Trace Kendig, but I have uh, the fill in for him today. Is he on? Is it Matt? Yes, Matt Bruner is here for him. Okay. Patrick Updike. Patrick Updike, Iowa Department of Corrections. Uh, okay, and that done. Any, any of our legislative members? Uh, Senator Jim Lycom. Senator Tim Capuchin. Representative.
Representative Bob Kresik, Representative Jared Klein. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the, uh, I believe this is our third virtual meeting. It's not the easiest thing to do, but uh, <clears throat> we'll get through it. I think we did wait, uh, people have just joined. Uh, we'll probably do this a little differently next time to make it clear that uh, you have to call in on the conference line to get the audio um, versus the go-to meeting, because when you go into go-to meeting, it's going to be silent, and you won't have an option to turn on the mic or anything. So, um, duly noted, and we'll uh, we'll try to get that fixed the next time. So, we're, everybody's on go-to meeting can get the audio straight from their computer. I need, uh, I'm looking forward to the approval of today's agenda, if I could get a motion for that. This is probably going to go a little slower than we like, because I will have to do a, a roll call on each one, because I cannot tell who's saying aye and who's saying nay. So go ahead and uh, need a, a, a recommendation for the approval of today's agenda. If I could get a motion for that, please. Ms. Hoffman. I'll, I'll make that motion. Hoffman. Ms. Hoffman. Ms. Hoffman. Ms. Hoffman. And Ms. Hoffman second. Uh, is there any further discussion? Okay. All in favor with the roll call, please. Trace Kidnig. Do you want me to call Madam Trace for that? I don't know how that works. Call people if you, you call Matt. Okay. Okay, so Matt Bruner? Yes. Patrick Update? Aye. Peter Huffman? Aye. Tom Lampy? Aye. Blake Gurushi? Aye. Wendy Hess? Aye. Andy Buffington? Aye. Michelle Bischoff? Aye. David Ness? Aye. Rob Rodner? Aye. Jason Schmittenhofer? Aye. And okay. Okay, hey, motion passes. Uh, looking for the motion of approval from the meeting minutes from April 9th, 2020. Get a real panel a motion for that, please. Yes. Yeah. Second. Second, Huffman. Second, on Huffman. Good roll call, please. Is there further discussion? Matt, Br Matt Bruner. Aye. Patrick Updike. Aye. Peter Huffman. Aye. Tom Lampy. Aye. Blake Durashi. Aye. Wendy Hess. Aye. Andy Buffington? Aye. Michelle Bischoff? Aye. David Ness? Aye. Rob Rodder? Aye. And Jason Schlutenhofer? Aye. Okay, hey, motion passes. Swift report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so again, want to uh, extend my thanks and gratitude to everybody uh, who is working uh, on COVID response. Uh, your efforts, time, and sacrifices are certainly appreciated. Uh, I'll roll through a few things here. Status board, uh, we were initially going to do a slow rollout of that, but we've expedited that over the last month or so. It's now running at full bore. Uh, as of this meeting, we have 57 unique agencies that have signed up. Uh, the vast majority of them are PSAPs, which is great because that's what this program is geared for. And we have 347 unique IDs on status board for end users to uh, use and coordinate their communications activities. If you or your agency has not yet signed up or if any of your neighbors have not yet signed up for it, please keep in mind that that is a free service. It helps you uh, maintain and run your communications operations uh, locally, which is the way we'd like it, and uh, really helps facilitate that communication. We do have a communications plan posted on there for COVID response. Uh, basically, the sixth TAC in each region is pre-allocated for uh, any type of COVID response, whether it's like a drive-through, testing, setup, or something along those lines. If you need to use something else because it may already be used in your region, uh, that's a good way to help coordinate with everybody else that you need to use, say something like TAC 15 or TAC uh, 35 
uh, instead of TAC 36 or, or, or something along those lines. So that is running. Uh, if you need to get your agency set up, just let me know. And uh, typically we can have that running within about two hours. Uh, quick update for everybody on some TR8 P25 uh, standards that I've recently worked on and voted on. I voted to approve standards on measurements of interference uh, with respect to P25 systems. And I also voted to approve uh, an addendum to a test for system calls. Uh, basically, the, uh, the addendum helps uh, de delineate between the type of response that is received during a system test call and it is also geared towards reducing hang time on radios after they end the transmission. So I voted to approve both of those. Uh, I've been working on making sure that some of the operations of the board continue to function as normally despite our, uh, our situation. Uh, update on the shared system study group. We uh, did not have an April meeting, but we will be meeting on Monday and we're working on lining up subject matter experts for future meetings. If there's a desire, I can elaborate on that a little bit further uh, down the agenda. Um, we are still working on deploying ISIX training to local agencies as well. Uh, with the help of uh, Robbie Johansson and Luke Erpelding and Sergeant Hove uh, from the State Patrol, we've been able to do some one-on-one -on -one virtual sessions. We've got a couple more lined up. Uh, most recently, we did one with Mills County, and we're working on the next immediate one, which would be with Wacon PD. So if anybody wants to have a one-on-one -on -one ISIX training session, let me know. Uh, one technical note for everybody to keep in mind, if you've, in, if you've integrated uh, a control station or a consulate that you've got from us and you do have an echo, there are anti-echo settings in a lot of dispatch consoles that can be activated that help mitigate most, if not all, of that issue. So we, we've learned that recently with a few of the platforms out there. So if you have uh, encountered those issues, uh, that would be something to check in with your local vendor on. Uh, that's my report, Mr. Chair. I will keep it as brief as possible today, and I will take any questions. Chris, do you have that file I sent you with the audio uh, showing let the, so the board members can hear the, the actual echo and what causes problems? Yeah, let me give it, just give me a second to get it popped up here, and I'll get her open. So I'm going to have to stop sharing my screen for a second while I pull that up. Okay, while well, you get that, uh, Blake, you can go ahead with your 911 council report. All right, thank you. Uh, we also had a virtual call today. Um, if you remember, we were not able to meet last month, so we had a, a couple months to catch up on. Uh, but we did uh, finally come up with a uh, approved proposal, a uh, proposal that was approved uh, for how we're going to spend training funds going forward. If you remember the last couple of years, um, there has been a lot of interest in the training funds that we are able to offer uh, to the point where we wanted to make sure we were doing it fair uh, and, and making sure that training occurred as it was scheduled and, and uh, everything was uh, everything was done right, I think, and had locals with uh, some skin in the game on, on that training. So uh, going forward, starting with next fiscal year, those training funds will be offered with a 10% local share. Uh, with the exclusions of the Law Enforcement Academy and APCO and NINA. Uh, so we don't necessarily uh, care how that 10% is arrived at at the, the local applicant level. Uh, it can be uh, brought to the table by the actual agency holding the training, or it can be through uh, uh, participant uh, registration fees. Uh, but, but going forward, starting in July, when that fund opens back up, there will be a 10% local uh, cost share as well. So um, other than that, we uh, basically just caught up over the last two months uh, of not having uh, meetings. Uh, didn't need to update people that the wireline migration was delayed by approximately a month. Uh, it might slide uh, five weeks or so, but uh, we're hoping to get those rescheduled uh, starting with Marshall County, uh, hopefully sometime in June. So. Uh, so everything is going okay with that. It's just uh, the third-party vendors uh, that ICN uh, deals with to make sure that infrastructure is in place. We're running a little behind. So uh, that schedule has basically just slipped, like I said, approximately one month. That is it from 911, unless there's any questions. Thanks. Okay, thanks. All right. Appreciate you have that.
Yes, I do, Mr. Chair. So I'll go ahead and play that now. Uh, we'll see how this comes through the speakers, and uh, I will stop it before it gets too uh, loud and obnoxious uh, with the echoing. So that's an example of what that can sound like after a transmission uh, when a patch is active. So is that what you're looking for, Mr. Chair? Yes, and what the importance of that is, is what it's doing is it's hanging up a channel, so it's taking up a talk group, so if somebody's trying to transmit, you can't. Uh, that goes on for any length of time. So it's a real problem, so we got to make sure we stay on top of it. If anybody hears that type, um, please let somebody know right away. Okay, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, Okay. Uh, uh, the UGC Chair Buffington, are you on? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, I'm going to have to jump off for a PPE drop here in a couple minutes. But uh, thank you. The uh, user group committee met briefly last month to consider two new applications that will be considered under new business. Again, I apologize. I likely will not be here for that. Um, but it's for Pottawatomie, Pottawatomie County at level two and Winchie County at a level one. Other than that, we uh, we had no other business before the uh, committee, and I would take any questions. All right, thank you. Andy, do you have someone lined up to make the motion for you for those two agencies? Uh, I do not. I just indicate I didn't know that this PPE drop was coming today until uh, well last minute. So I I have not talked to. Uh, my vice chair, um, I would be fine with um, Swick Myers since he was on the call to do that for me if that's uh, if that's appropriate under Robert's rules. Uh, uh, Swick can't; he's not a voting member, so uh, we'll have to have it, uh, somebody else make the motion. I'm here, thank Andrew. You. Oh well, thank goodness, Rob. Would you do that for me since you're my favorite human being that lives in West Des Moines that I know of? Right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to finance. I think Swick Buyers will take care of this one. Yes, Mr. Chair. So the financial report for the most recent uh, month of board activity, uh, monthly expenditures during April for the Interoperable and Broadband Communications Fund were $6,119. The April ending balance was $143,812. The monthly expenditures during April for Sleep P 2.0 were $20,001. Of that amount, $16,001 were federal expenditures. The remaining federal amount from this grant is $326,326. A uh, very convenient uh, number total to have left over. Uh, does the board have any questions regarding the activities or financial position of the board with respect to the Interoperable and Broadband Communications Fund or SLEEP P2.0? Do we have a for replacement for the finance chair since Ellen is gone? Not yet. I uh, was going to talk to a few people about that. Uh, I know uh, we've got some board members that um, I have not had a chance to reach out to yet. Uh, for committee placements because of um, some uh, COVID stuff that popped up recently and everybody's schedule is getting tied up. But my hope is that we can have a chair allocated for that within the next uh, month or so. Identified is probably the okay. better word to use than al a allocated, but have a chair identified. So. <laughs> I was thinking of money. All right. So. <laughs> Yes, we met 
and uh, discuss the continued work on the sub-regional request um, that is greatly impacted by the COVID events as far as um, getting the packet put together out of Des Moines and Spokane. County. Um, but there, there is effort being put forth is just at a much slower pace due to conflicting interest. The, um, we also discussed uh, the work that's happening um, in regards to what the standards working group is, is looking at um, and provided some input um, regarding the use of, of the call talk group, the cost specific zone, um, in particular what items are toned and not. So just trying to make some refinements um, with the standards working group. Um, the operations group is providing some areas of concern. And then the standards working group is kind of re uh, refining those, tuning them um, to incorporate them into the standards. Um, so all of that, we're just kind of working in conjunction with them. Um, and then uh, there's much, much other discussion happening within the operations group. We just haven't uh, formulated, you know, nothing's risen to the top of, of things to be worked on. Um, lots of open conversation as to how are things working and how do we make things better. Um, so, yeah, the operations group is, is now meeting and continuing on. What questions do you have for me in regards to operations? Thank you. Karen, I've got a quick question for a comment for uh, Michelle, if I might, this is Dave. Go ahead. Yeah, I just really appreciate the uh, work they're putting into the uh, sub-regional uh, discussion. Uh, I know everybody's been uh, very occupied uh, with uh, co additional COVID responsibilities and in addition already a uh, heavy workload. But just here in the uh, metro, I think we've got uh, uh, three PSAPs or uh, radio systems that are all uh, on the verge of needing to uh, update uh, fleet maps and uh, uh, issue new radios. And we're uh, anxious uh, for a determination on that from the full board. And so it, don't mean to put it undue pressure, but really appreciate the work that you guys are doing, and uh, and we're anxious to see it uh, come to fruition or come before the board in a uh, coming meeting. Thanks, Dave. Yes. Thanks. Yes. We we just need to get the packet completed from the three the three PSAPs need to make contributions um, as to the how the putting that application together. That, that's the piece that we're waiting on. So Different. as soon as Thank we you. can make those submissions, we can move forward. Thanks. All right. We'll move on to outreach with Myers. Okay, got that one too. Yeah. So um Outreach Committee has been working on a couple of projects recently, one which has been undertaken by Holly Davidson, which is a revitalization of the newsletter. I believe that went out this morning. Uh, Holly's done a phenomenal job with updating that. The PDF version is the first one to see the update. The email version will be updated soon as well. Uh, again, want to restate Holly's done an excellent job with this newsletter. Uh, when you open it up, it has a very professional, inviting, and warm feel to it with the way it's laid out and the content that could be potentially added to that. I uh, want to extend my thanks to Holly for that. And, uh, you know, work will continue to update the uh, uh, email version of it. And we will we'll be working on more outreach sessions as uh, people start moving around again post-COVID for the first net and joint ISIX outreach uh, sessions. That was great. Great look to it. Um, I like the spotlight each month on someone. So if you know somebody that deserves uh, some recognition, get a whole holly. We'll put them on the spotlight for the month. All right, training committee. Yes, thank you. Um, so as you might imagine, with the no travel orders in place for many agencies, 
Uh, we've had to postpone our TAs. Now, we originally had an SOP development TA scheduled for March 24th. Uh, we had to postpone. We've had a couple of encryption ones that were lined up and almost ready to go. We've had to postpone those as well, along with our COML, COMT, and COMX. Um, at this point, we are looking to see which one of these we could hold virtually. I would say there's a fairly high probability that we'd be able to hold the SOP development and the encryption TA remotely. Uh, with the encryption one, we were initially looking at doing a webinar for decision makers uh, so that they could have a working understanding of basics of encryption and then a more in-depth one for the technology oriented folks. Um, it looks like we could probably do both of those virtually potentially, but we have to have a discussion with ECD first and uh, we're expecting those discussions to take place next week. Uh, I believe Jim Lundstedt and uh, Dick Tenney from uh, ICTAP are going to be on the call with us along with people within the training committee. Uh, as far as additional training goes, um, we are working on some just-in-time training for uh, PSAPs as well. This has been in conjunction with some uh, conversations with Des Moines PD and, and other metropolitan agencies and some rural PSAPs about any type of continuing operations or CONOP or COOP plans, however you like to reference them. Uh, basic questions that you should be asking yourselves as you're going through that process. So in the situation that we're in currently, there also may be an element of tactical dispatching that has to be worked into that as well. Uh, we've been working with uh, ICTAP uh, on getting something like that developed. It is a brand new concept, so it's an organic course that's coming right from Iowa. My hope is that we could get that uh, finalized here in the next couple of weeks and start accepting sign-up admissions for that uh, around that same time frame. So uh, be looking for the ISIC board uh, website for that uh, information to come out when it does. And uh, that is the report of the training committee. I'll go ahead and take any questions. comments on the, uh, the policy um, hit the draft that went out for a 30-day comment. So not really much going on. I did throw a little curveball at the group and we were, I don't know that we'll go too far with this, but I brought up the subject of the potential for hacking of unmanned aerial systems, aircraft systems, aka drones. I had uh, seen some information on some uh, unmanned aircraft systems that could potentially be compromised. So that was just one of those things I threw out there it was technologically um, possible, I suppose you could say. Uh, the, we're still working on getting a VCall 10 recommendation put out. And finally, I did attend a CAPRAD webinar, if you will, uh, dealing with 601 forms, um, things like uh, 700 tank frequencies things like that. So that's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay. Move on to the first step broadband committee, Chair Bishop. Uh, we did meet this month and um, the who's on first net, I've spoken of that previously, um, is continuing to be populated and I would encourage um, you if you are on first net to uh, Put yourself on the Who's on FirstNet so that everyone knows um, which devices you're using. Um, it can be used for not only consultation of you know what's working, what's not working, but also um, knowing that uh, we'll be able to get to uh, connect with that agency using FirstNet um, and have the priority and preemption in place and not need to use the WPS um, aspect of priority um, in talking with that agency, it will uh, serve us well um, in the long term. We also had two guest speakers, um, Trace Elfini, um, he's a senior advisor with AT&T, um, so he's available to us to help us with our more challenging um, installations of where we'd like to see uh, first that um, 
deployed as far as devices or in um, challenging units or for atypical uses. Um, so she's just a resource that's available to us, as well as we had Jen Lundstead um, give us a briefing on um, GETS and WPS. Our next meeting, we will have Andy Sackreiter, who is the network engineer for our area, um, and we are collecting questions for Andy um, until May 26th. So I would make that offer to the board if they have any questions in regards to the AT&T network in Iowa, either on performance or where it's headed, um, those sorts of questions. Um, feel free to submit those to me prior to May 26th, and we'll be sure to include them with our conversation uh, with Andy. What questions do you have for me regarding first step? Thank you. I see the <clears throat> newsletter is, is posting the, the new sites for first and it's got a section for first and so that's good. All right, uh, Leah, committee chair stuff will be where you on and uh, Sheriff Rotter, you can oh, chime yes. in whenever you need to. Yes, I'm on. Uh, we will not be having a meeting this month due to some other obligations that, that uh, members have, but we have been working on the, the tower utilization reports, which is telling us how many uh, LEA transmissions are being being used every month. And most of them that have any large numbers are due to noise on the lines, on the old telephone lines. So uh, actually the numbers that we're seeing is, are pretty much what I expected. We're also uh, working on and making sure that we have everything in, our, in all of our ducks in a row for the the tower usage by PSAP, the, uh, the consulate installations to make sure that everybody has those uh, consulates or the control stations installed and to make sure that the training and the testing has been done. And uh, next month when we have our meeting, We'll be able to go through all of that at length. Are there any questions? So you're assisting Chris with uh, making sure that everybody gets it installed and answers the test calls to ensure that we have everybody on the system for in or off. Uh, Chris is he, he's more than welcome to use me at any time. He's he's providing us the information so that we can make sure that everybody's done it. If we need to make phone calls, we'll be able to do that before, uh, you know, sooner than later. Because in on November 1st, when the LEA lines are taken out, we just don't want anybody to be, be left out there without a, 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 a usable access. I know the list is getting shorter. I think Chris will expand on that when he's under other reports. So uh, I would encourage any yeah. help you can give Chris to encourage to get this taken care of. Uh, make sure that we uh, have everybody on. It would be great. Okay. That date will come quick. It will. We're, we're there to help any way we can. Okay. Uh, Sheriff Ryder, did you have anything you'd like to add? No, I think you it all out there perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Okay, you got some background noise and you can mute your phone up here in radio traffic. Great. Uh, other reports? Um, we'll start off with, uh, I'm going to have Chris go ahead and jump in right now. Uh, we neglected to get the uh, shared system study group report. If you have one, Chris, we'll make sure that's on the agenda last next time. Yeah, no problem. I can go ahead and, and, and roll through some more details on that. Uh, the shared system study group met for the first time in March. Uh, it, it was a good introductory meeting. Um, I think it was a chance for everybody to get a true operational picture of what actually is out there uh, with respect to those that are using VHF, those that are using ISIX, those that are using other networks with respect to trunking and non-trunking. And, uh, you know, a lot of the members there uh, gained a lot of insights on what everybody else is contending with from a technology standpoint with their shared with their systems. 
um, we were able to outline um, what everybody wanted to accomplish and also some things that we knew were immediate concerns. Uh, one thing that came up right away was cost. One thing that came up right away was training and also other types of governance policies and structures in addition to the technology. So we've got a good direction uh, to go from here. The one thing that we did notice, and this was pointed out by Deputy Swick Walzer, uh, was that a lot of the things that were brought up in the meeting don't necessarily fall in the world of technology. So for example, governance and training, uh, that's not a technology thing. And we dove into some tangential elements of the SAFECOM interoperability continuum and started discussing that uh, to kind of get a better sense of where we were with respect to our needs for interoperability. Uh, we didn't meet in April, but one thing we had talked about was trying to allocate some time in April to go over the continuum. So what, what I did was I sent out some of the seminal documents from the SAFECOM continuum and the most current publicly available version of it to them so that they could get familiarized with it. Uh, most of the time when people see the continuum, they just see the image. Um, you may have seen it in a sales pitch or two, but uh, there's actually a pamphlet and accompanying documents that go along with it that elaborate and expound on a lot of the principles of that continuum, and they're very good reads. Um, so those were sent out in April. Um, we will be meeting on Monday to discuss more of the uh, goals of the Shared System Study Group and we're also going to be discussing some work that has been done in the state of Connecticut between uh, state of Connecticut and New York with respect to an ISSI deployment and issues that have been encountered with a Harris and Moto integration or an attempted uh, in integration in that part of the country. Uh, that should be a, a good subject material for everybody there. And uh, we will have a report available for next month. I will go ahead and take okay, it. Appreciate it. Well, that's, well, that's going well. That's a, that's a complex uh, system uh, or group we're trying to get. Uh, yeah, there's technology, let's put it that way. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot of elements that need to be uh, unpeeled from that onion that is the ISSI. And, uh, you know, the devil truly is in the details with that type of technology. So we're making progress. Well, if you have 
you don't have a microwave on on the uh, mobile command, which we, we, it'd be almost impossible to do, you have to figure out another way to do it. And the only other way is either satellite or LTE. It has been done in other states with satellite, um, but we're trying uh, to be actually one of the first in the country, if not the first, to make it a site on wheels with LTE. And I'm planning on using the FirstNet uh, system for that. And uh, also a, a backup on um, Verizon in case we don't have service on either one of the carriers for some particular reason. We're in a hole somewhere with that site. So they've been working on that to try to get that technology to uh, to work to get the uh, site to be recognized as wide area trucking. This has been going on for about three weeks now. Then I threw them another curve. Um, not only do I want that site in uh, wide trunking, I also want a full dispatch center in that vehicle. Uh, to be able to dispatch as if you were sitting in front of the panel and not over the air, just so to speak. So that includes another set of uh, challenges with another modem because the dispatch council is actually another site that the court recognizes as a site. So we had to get another. So we got a total of four modems right now of Sierra wireless modems with two Ended up have, we'll probably end up having two different carriers in each for redundancy and coverage purposes. But they're, they're working on that and they've got all the, uh, the brains together. Uh, they've met twice now. Um, super complex. And, uh, but I think they've got a solution and we're going to be hopefully getting to that solution here in the next few weeks. So if that, if that indeed works, um, it'd be a, real game changer for us. And what I mean by that is you can now dispatch fully, have full dispatch capabilities um, anywhere in the state. And you could, we could also, um, our STR trailer, uh, which the board is responsible for, is a actual site trunking uh, trailer also, which has got a six pack in it. So that's never been uh, challenged on making that a wide area trunking. So if this works with our mobile command, um, I'll present to the board uh, what it would take to get the uh, SDR trailer uh, in wide area trunking also when it's deployed. So that way, every radio that roams to it, um, it isn't practical for uh, the board to require or suggest that every radio in the state of Iowa has a zone in it for a site trunking for the SDR. That's just, that's just not practical. So we want to make it as easy as possible so when that site is up that any radio uh, we'll roam to it just as if it's a uh, it's site uh, on the network. So that's what's been going on. Um, it's at JFHQ right now, it's sitting on top of the hill. Actually, both the STR and the mobile command are there. Because I want to make sure that when they do the mobile command that they update the STR too with all the updates. So they have to physically plug that into the core. So we got a long cable running um, from the core, the hut, to the mobile command to get that configured and then we'll make sure that the STR trailer is all up to speed with all the latest updates because it's been a few years. Any questions on that? Second thing I want to talk to you about um, that I'll share with you is we're, with the help of Des Moines Police, uh, they allowed us to attend. Uh, they're going through OTAR training, over-the-air rekeying training, and uh, that is for encryption keys that you can uh, throw it over the air of the ISIC system if you choose to use OTAR. Um, what we've discovered uh, the last couple days of the training uh, is that if you do and ch choose to use OTAR training, there's some things that uh, that came up that are pretty uniform when it, when uh, you do over the air keying, and be, and I'm not going to get into the full details, but what we've discovered is we're more than likely, for sure, going to have to form a working group committee on the board at the board level to discuss OTAR. And Chris, you can jump in here when I'm finished, uh, because there's a lot of uh, things that I didn't realize that, that came with OTAR. And I think by uh, attending this class, it, it is truly evident that the board needs to uh, create some type of a policy and protocol on when we push OTAR over the air, when, when at, at regular intervals, if you're if you're choosing to use the technology over the air and you don't have a KMF key loader that you just use for yourself and you choose to use OTAR, 
there's some things that it's kind of quirky that needs to be uh, explained and uh, that the committee can uh, sort through to to uh, do policy and protocol. And it, it's pretty it's pretty simple in regards to the policy, but it has to do with when you do the new keys on a yearly basis, the quarterly, six months, however. But that's part of what the committee would be charged to do is to, is to decide when those keys are pushed, new keys that is, over the air to radios. So. If anybody have any questions on that, Chris, you can uh, certainly uh, lead off of that if you like. If not, that's yeah. fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, add, uh, we've had an encryption subcommittee uh, group in the past as an ad hoc committee underneath the board uh, and the technology committee. Uh, this would be a perfect opportunity for them to meet and learn about what was uh, uncovered during OTAR training and uh, develop uh, an appropriate policy or standard from that. Uh, like Tom alluded to, it's not a deal breaker for anything. It's just a few quirks that, that people have to know about before they dive into it head first. Um, and if they're aware of those quirks, it'll uh, make sure everybody's happy as they work on deploying it and uh, start using it. So uh, it'd be a perfect opportunity to rope that into that encryption subcommittee. All right. Does anybody else have anything to share? Okay, uh, we'll move on to, I believe Melvin is on the phone, so he told me by text. So Melvin, are you there? I am. Okay, so we'll go ahead with you with the uh, project report on Essex. All right, as we, uh, as you can see, moving forward, uh, we're getting a little bit closer to the end here. Uh, the uh, building yet, in essence, just a, a few things. The first thing is the uh, art insight. Uh, so we've been in talks uh, city of Bible Falls, so we seem to be coming to uh, close the uh, resolution to that one. Um, uh, so if all works well, we should be able to schedule something to, to get started and complete that site. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, the site is operational, being used. We just have to finish the uh, retaining wall and the uh, access road, uh, but we need uh, permission from the city and from Jason Plan Owner so we can complete that. Once those uh, agreement is in place, uh, we will move forward. So we actually have a couple of folks uh, going up there uh, today to take a look at things. So we just will try and uh, plan ahead. So when we get the green light, we can jump at it and get going. Uh, the other piece is the uh, Rock Rapids uh, construction. So uh, I'm excited to report that we finally completed the teardown of the uh, legacy IPTV tower. We finished it yesterday. Um, so all the pieces are down, all the guy wires are down, and they're currently working on removing the legacy guy anchors. Uh, by contract, we are, uh, you know, cutting them off down, uh, four feet, uh, below, uh, grade. Uh, also, they also need the, uh, foundation for the tower, uh, for the legacy tower as well. So it's an ongoing thing, uh, but that's uh, excellent news. Uh, it's been a challenge, uh, it's been windy. And, uh, you know, as we pull the segments of the old tower down, uh, you know, we didn't want to deal with, uh, you know, there was concerns about the uh, you know, tower segments that are being pushed around by the wind. And we had to make sure that we didn't have collisions with the new tower or with the new guy wires as well. The good news is that we're done with that, and we are on schedule to start the microwave dish install next week. Uh, we have a call with the microwave uh, subcontractor uh, tomorrow to uh, solidify that, make sure everybody's in place. And if weather cooperates, we'll be able to get that done in about a week. Once that's done, then we we'll have our, our techs go and occupy the site, and then we'll prep up and get ready for uh, coverage testing in Lyon County and Sioux County, uh, those two upper north uh, west counties in the state. Those are the only two counties that remain. We've been holding them back because we want to make sure that the rock rock site was up in the air before we completed those. So everything seems to be lining up right now, and then the rest of it is really just the, uh, the sidewalk as we continue the sidewalks in an ongoing process. And, uh, you know, we did some sidewalks this week, we did the previous week, and we expect for next week. So it's ongoing, and uh, I think that we're pretty close. That's all I 
yet. Melvin, you want to explain how we're doing the sidewalks? Or I can, up to you. Yeah, so uh, we were uh, trying to figure out, you know, once the COVID-19 thing came, uh, we're trying to figure out how do we keep moving. And so we're doing, uh, we decided to do uh, virtual sidewalks, which is, uh, we do it via video uh, conference. And uh, so, uh, Matthew and uh, the DOT and DPS teams provide people folks uh, anchored in their uh, offices, and they get to watch uh, as we walk the site, and they command us uh, what to look for, uh, and we go through the checklist, and we do a video confirmation of, of all those things, and they capture images as we move along. And uh, it's worked out actually uh, pretty well. In some cases, uh, you know, we do have a break in between travel from one side to the other. In other cases, we actually have uh, multiple folks at different sites, so we can do them back to back, so that uh, the space, you know, saves and travel time and all that stuff. Uh, we do it for them. Very good. Any questions for Melvin? Okay, we'll move on to uh, the first net AT and T. David Barnett, are you on the line? Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. I am here. Good morning to okay. everyone. Look forward to when we can all get back together again and, and see each other in person. Um, during the month of April, we had two sites that uh, had both LTE and Band 14 that were launched. One is in Winfield. Iowa in Henry County, and the other is a site in Hamlet, Illinois. Um, not sure how much that would help Iowa. The reason that it's on the map, if you guys can see the map, is because I have a little bit of territory in Illinois, so the engineer, since it's part of my coverage area that I handle, they, they put that uh, actually on the map. Um, first, that's been very busy making sure that we're supporting agencies with the current pandemic that's been going on. So we've been concentrating on reaching out to health departments, police departments, sheriff's departments, EMS, to everyone throughout the state to make sure that they're aware of what FirstNet is and that FirstNet is there to support them for their communication and data needs in any way possible. So we've been definitely trying to, again, make sure that everybody knows that we're here to assist in any way that we can to make sure that you have the voice and data communication that you need during the, the ongoing pandemic that we're experiencing. And that's all I've got. If anybody has any questions you ring up, be happy to answer them. Oh, well, one more quick thing I forgot. We should have the black first net SIM card is scheduled to be functioning on US cellular roaming by the end of this month. So within the next two weeks, the first net SIM card should be roaming on US So Once that is official, I will make sure I get the, the word out so that everybody uh, is, is aware of that. But again, that should be happening within the next two weeks. All right, any questions for David? Thanks, David. Bye, Dale. Jim Lundstedt, are you on the phone? Good morning, Chair Lampy. Is the audio okay here on speakerphone? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, very quick update from ACD. Um, from our perspective, I uh, would offer that you have a neighbor who is also developing a LTE to support Site on Wheels project that also uses a Motorola system that has two sites on wheels that are currently satellite that they are stuttering studying implementing Sierra Wireless Backhaul over FirstNet as a solution that may be of use. Uh, be happy to share the information with Swick Myers if interested. They're going down the exact same route you are to uh, look at a more effective, cost-effective and reliable solution than the satellite on demand requirement. I've uh, been using those sites on wheels for about 10 years, so it's a modernization, but may have a tip or two that they've learned or would learn from you that could be useful. Um, 
I'm under ICTAP, our Interoperable Communications Technical Assistance Program. I briefed to the 911 Council that for the last six and a half, seven weeks, we've not been able to conduct any in-person meetings, uh, direct support to activities. We are exploring alternatives such as uh, SWIFT Fires briefed, and we are open to ideas for how we might be able to support uh, individuals, states, territories, tribes, or entities with a specific request as long as it's virtual as we begin the uh, process of in-person training that will be uh, uh, rolled out as states and territories request but as of right now we're still pretty much on hiatus until we can identify opportunities to deliver uh, virtual training. I've been sharing quite a bit of information with the SWIC community and the 911 community on uh, activities related to COVID-19 planning, response, and particularly emphasis on the cybersecurity aspect. There has been a lot of activity uh, among nation, state, and domestic uh, threat actors who have been uh, attacking via ransomware or attempting to exploit vulnerabilities in both the healthcare and the research sectors as we study opportunities to develop vaccines and other uh, ways to remediate uh, COVID-19. And there's been a lot of information shared on that through our SWIC communities. We also published a document on disinformation about what's going on in the, uh, in the social media world about understanding the uh, uh, media and different biases that are apparent in reporting that is uh, available on CISA.gov under COVID-19 disinformation. We publish a newsletter called CISA Insights that gives a little detail on that. For your awareness, uh, there's also a developing concern about uh, disinformation about 5G networks, in other words, millimeter wave next generation cellular networks being related to COVID-19. This actually started uh, elsewhere, but we believe it is being, uh, flames are being fanned by those who want to develop a following that it's a conspiracy theory that 5G is somehow harmful to humans. And there was actually a communications tower felled in Nevada last week by individuals who uh, cut down the guy wires with a cutting torch. So we are urging people to be particularly vigilant about your infrastructure. If they uh, cut down a guide tower thinking it's a cellular site, that does not necessarily mean that it is cellular. In fact, the tower that was dropped was in a rural enough area that 5G was not even on the chart, but there was a wireless carrier who lost service. And as you can imagine, in this time, that's quite a challenge when you lose a, a high site such as this, I believe it's a 340 foot tower. Um, other than that, uh, Chair Lampy, nothing further to report. Any questions for me? You sent me the point of contact. Are you, you said Missouri's doing the uh, mobile command thing? No, state of Kansas. Oh, Kansas. Yeah, where are we talking to them? Yep. Okay, good. Missouri Appreciate has planned to do that as well, but I don't know how mature it is. But I can certainly ask if they have any perspective on that yet, sir. Okay, appreciate it. Okay. Standards Working Group, Mr. Myers. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Standards Working Group met last month. Uh, had a pretty extensive meeting that covered uh, the mounting of things like VHF paging equipment on state-built ISIC sites and what that process would look like. Uh, also covered um, alert tones and some early semblances of what that uh, update may look like, uh, as you've heard from uh, the operations group and a few others that have talked about that. Uh, also, I've been working on a standard for status board uh, that I believe we're also coordinating with operations on. Uh, nothing to put forth to governance this coming month, but we are meeting at the tail end of May and we'll hopefully have had something before governance uh, for the governance meeting in early June. Uh, that's my report. I'll take any questions. Okay, you might as well move on to the control station. Yeah, so we have another set of test calls set up for the 21st of May. Uh, those will start at 8 o'clock in the morning. 
and uh, they're for 10 P saps. Of those 10 P saps, at least four of them have console integration projects that are in various stages of completion. So if you look at the numbers in which um, you, you remove those core connected dispatch consoles, there's maybe five or six PSAPs that are actually still truly working on the control station. Of those, most of those are still waiting for parts or pieces from the vendor and or vendor installation to get uh, completed. Uh, the regions that are affected by this, there's uh, one from every region, uh, but for the most part, the numbers are starting to dwindle quite a bit on those that have not yet established a, a, a connection. For those that have uh, integrated already, uh, if you do encounter any weirdness with any echoes, uh, check with your vendor about an echo suppression setting that's available on several dispatch consoles from what I've seen so far from some limited use cases that has solved a lot of those technical issues with any echoing you may have when you patch into a conventional channel. Um, otherwise, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Take any questions. There's no old business. We'll move on to new business. And the first item is the new ISIX user approval uh, Chair Buffington referred to earlier. Um, looks like we have a Pottawatomie County Level 2 and Winnesheet County Level 1. Uh, do we have anybody, uh, any board member that would like to make a motion to approve those two? Um, this is Dave Nash. Dave Nash, I heard Peter as a second. Any further discussion? Are we gonna, this is Updike, are we gonna separate these out or are we just gonna blanket? Well, I think I think we should probably just do, we'll just blanket Pottawatomie County Level 2 and Winnesheet County Level 1 as one uh, motion and one uh, roll call. Okay. So, Polly, if you wanna go ahead and do that. Okay, Matt Bruner? Aye. Patrick Updike? Aye. Peter Huffman? Aye. Tom Lampy? Aye. Blake Gershi? Aye. Wendy Hess? Aye. Andy Buffington? Michelle Bischoff? Aye. David Ness? Aye. Bob Broder? Aye. And Jason Schlutenhofer? Aye. Okay, the motion, the motion passes. LTE policy is the next uh, item up for new business. This is Updike. I can take this. Okay, um, go ahead. Last month, we, um, well, over the months, we've been working on this draft policy statement uh, requiring frequency coordination by vendors or agencies deploying mobile LTE broadband vehicles. Uh, last month, we uh, went ahead and had the 30-day uh, comment period approved, and that 30 days is up. Um, Swick Myers didn't report any comments coming in. If he wants to add to that, I would I would uh, allow him to do that now. Yes, thank you, Mr. Updike. Um, so when we posted this for comment, the recommendation was made to not only post this on the website, but to send it directly to the LTE carriers that we know have a fairly prominent presence in Iowa. And what I did after that was I sent it directly to US Cellular, Verizon, and AT&T uh, so that it was on their desks. Um, one of the carriers said, we're going to send this over to someone that handles this type of stuff for us. So they did that. So we know it was circulated at least in some way, shape or form. Uh, my, based on everything I have in front of me, we have not received any comments on this policy. So given that it's been out for 30 days for comment, um, as uh, Chair Updike mentioned, uh, we could probably vote on uh, whether or not to officially adopt this policy. So, Mr. Uh, Chair Updike, I'll give it back to you. Okay, thanks. So, I'm going to make a motion. that we go ahead and adopt the policy statement requiring frequency coordination by vendors or agencies deploying mobile LTE broadband vehicles? Okay, a motion by Mr. Updike for uh, adopting this policy for LTE. Uh, do I have a second motion? Yes. Yes, is a second.
second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, take a roll call, please. Matt Bruder? Aye. Patrick Update? Aye. Peter Huffman? Aye. Tom Lampy? Aye. Blake Dershey? Aye. Wendy Hess? Aye. Michelle Bischoff? Aye. David Ness? Aye. Rob Rodder? Aye. And Jason Schlutenhofer? Aye. Okay, the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, we are next item up for agenda is the public comment period. If anybody on the phone would like to address the board at this time, you're free to do that. Okay, hearing none, uh, motion for adjournment. We'll move, Jason. We'll move Jason and Huffman. Thank you. We are adjourned at uh, 1136. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.